I was a little boy when I saw my first eagle. It was the coolest thing. I heard the call. I felt a sense of freedom, a sense of wilderness, of hope. It gave me goosebumps. It's the call that symbolizes Africa. It's the call of Africa's most spectacular eagle, the African fish eagle. My name is Munir Virani, and I've been studying these eagles for over 20 years at Lake Nevasha, a very special lake in the heart of Kenya's Great Rift Valley, home to one of the world's biggest concentrations of wildlife. Nevasha has grown into one of Kenya's greatest economic miracles, having some of the world's largest flower farms, a geothermal power plant that supplies half of Kenya's electricity and a rapidly growing human population. But this story is not about the lake. It's about the African fish eagles and how they're coping with the pressures caused by man. I, I think without exception, everybody who lives around the lake it is absolutely shocked at what's going on. I don't see the future. It's, it's, it doesn't look bright. A whole lot of things have changed, not all of them for the best. Well, fish eagles, you know, even today, the fish eagle numbers are just still amazing. There are so many poachers. When people realize the effects of what they are consuming, then they will seek alternative fish to consume. And I would say that the biggest threat now is the people themselves. We found DDT um, as well in all of the samples that, uh, that were collected and analyzed at Lake Nevasha. All those birds have declined by over 75%. There's many, many so problems that the acacia have to do. Now the impact side. of lead on animals just don't and have human beings is very documented. And I can say that high levels of the soil are going to be Lake Nevasha is the highest freshwater lake in Kenya's Great Rift Valley with a dynamic, exciting and somewhat tumultuous history. It is recognized as one of the world's top 10 birdwatching sites, having a unique biodiversity that includes the highest concentration of African fish eagles in the world.
but Lake Nevasha has undergone severe and dramatic environmental, climatic, and human-caused changes over the last 100 years. As a result, there have been corresponding changes in biodiversity, landscape, water levels, and socioeconomics. Despite these pressures, Lake Nevasha has an unshakable resilience that enables it to support an incredible wilderness and a thriving economy. In Africa, no other bird has come to symbolize elegance, majesty, and splendor like the African fish eagle. In African mythology, the fish eagle is known as Tai and is traditionally revered as the keeper of the waters. The African fish eagle is the quintessential flagship of African lakes and rivers, and its call is symbolic of the African sunrise. That eagle over there, I call her CF. She's a spirited and determined female. We tagged her in 1997 as part of a banding program to understand why fish eagles were not producing chicks in the mid-1990s. She has been around the block a long time, at least 20 years as an adult. She has seen it all, the good times and the carnage. Last year, she successfully raised three chicks and has always raised multiple chicks year after year. There is something really special about her. Fish eagles are apex predators and prefer water bodies that are clear and shallow with thriving fish populations. They nest mainly on tall trees that overlook the water. At Nevasha, fish eagles breed around May and usually raise two chicks that leave the nest after about four months. Juveniles are dark and scruffy, and it takes them up to five years to get the gorgeous adult plumage. Fish eagles normally hunt in long, shallow dives and prefer snatching fish from the surface. Like all birds of prey, fish eagles are renowned for their excellent eyesight, being able to see forward and sideways at the same time. Yeah, I, did, I did this experiment once with a group of students further up the lake and the boat was a good almost a kilometre away from the shore and there were a pair of eagles sitting on a perch about 30 metres high and we had a small tilapia about three or four inches long small brown fish same colour as the lake and I dropped it out of the boat on the other side of the boat so they couldn't see it as soon as the boat left the scene they were off the perch and straight at that fish so their visual acuity is about 8 to 16 times our own. Fish eagles are capable of seeing fish in the water from several hundred feet above, while soaring, gliding, or in flapping flight. This is quite an extraordinary feat, since most fish are countershaded, meaning they are darker on top and much harder to see from above. In the late 1960s, the late Dr. Leslie Brown pioneered fish eagle studies around Lake Nevasha. After that, he published his magnificent and classic book, The African Fish Eagle, which paved the way for future biologists and researchers to study this magnificent eagle. I first met Leslie when he was um, living in Karen, um, and he had a pair of crowned eagles um, near his house. And Every now and again, he would come to Naivasha to count fish eagles. And a number of people like myself, we were in our early 20s then, two or three of us would often come with him. And he would take us all out in his boat and we would count fish eagles. Some of us would stand on the shoreline uh, for an hour or so and he would go around the lake in his boat and we would make a count of fish eagles on that particular day. 
um, and then we'd all meet up in the evening, we'd camp on the lake shore. Yeah, I was with uh, Leslie Brown, who was at that time one of the biggest gurus. So uh, about 1976 or 77 or something, I used to go here on occasion. Uh, I do think I sat on the famous boat of his that was parked at uh, Alan and Joan Root's house. And he would like to go out there and uh, pretty much just sort of drink and watch the sunset go down and look at his eagles, his fish eagles. When Leslie Brown did his studies here, he counted over 250 fish eagles around the lake. He also found that there was a very healthy ratio between adults and young birds, suggesting that these birds were doing fantastic around the lake. Understanding why fish eagles were thriving on Lake Nevasha, we need to go back in time to the end of the 19th century. This lake has had a very long history of water fluctuations. In 1884, when the explorer Joseph Thompson walked across Lake Nevasha, this lake was virtually dry, except for a little pond right in the middle of the lake. After just 10 years of when this photo was taken, heavy rains caused a lake water level rise of up to 6 meters, which resulted in the lake shore expanding by 8 kilometers from the center. We put it in historical context though, there are pictures here I think taken in the 1920s, 1930s, where you look out across what was then hardly anything of a lake, and there were no trees. It was an open plain, so obviously the fish eagles weren't as numerous. Historically, rainfall has been the main driver of the fluctuations in the lake's water levels. In 1925, non-native fish species were introduced in the lake to enhance sport fishing. Tilapia were first put in from nearby Athi River to produce food for the American largemouth bass introduced later at the suggestion of former US President Theodore Roosevelt, who believed that it would help sport fishing here. By 1945, the lake was at its lowest with a level of only 60 centimeters. And by 1967, Nevasha's lake level came up by seven vertical meters, spreading over kilometers and transforming it into a paradise for birds and other animals. It was quite unbelievable. It was just as Joseph Thompson said in 1883, that lake is a moving mass of water birds. And that's exactly what it was, particularly in the early 60s. It was a moving mass of wildlife. Water lilies, it had the most stunning scenery birds by their thousands, ducks by their thousands, herons, egrets, jacanas, were just everywhere. And so it was a bird watcher's paradise. And people who came here just simply couldn't believe it. It was very, very different from where it, what it is now. The water was absolutely clear. If you went fishing, you could watch the fish following your lure in. The lake was slightly bigger than it is today. The water was much clearer. There were thousands of coots that used to be on the lake. Those are some of the memories you have of the early days of Naimasha. This crystal clear water, these immense numbers of birds. What changed? Explosion of human population. In the early 1980s, Lake Nevasha began to change from the growth of two important industries that needed lots of water, horticulture and geothermal energy. One of the biggest extractors of water from Lake Nevasha is Kenjen. They need the water for drilling. The old power station uses lake water to cool the turbines. But I don't believe they do anything. They give the lake back anything. Kenya's first geothermal power plant was developed southwest of Lake Nevasha, producing 45 megawatts of energy. Today, geothermal power produces half of Kenya's electricity. 
At around the same time, Nevasha's horticultural farms also began to take off. Uh, one of the people who just, only, who just actually take water from the, from the lake, they are flower farms. And the horticulture industry started setting up in the early 80s. And by the mid-1980s, uh, you, you saw the establishment of greenhouses all along the shore of the lake. In those days, they were just taking the water direct from the lake. From humble beginnings, Lake Nevasha now supplies 20% of the roses sold in Europe and 70% of the United Kingdom's market, making it a multi-million dollar industry for Kenya. There are more than 60 flower farms in the Nevasha Basin, employing more than 50,000 people. To them, Lake Nevasha offered abundant fresh, clean water, over 300 days of sunshine a year, and only two hours from an international airport where they could export their produce, be it agriculture or floriculture flowers. And that just increased and increased and increased. In 2014, Kenya's flower industry raked in nearly $600 million. But this top GDP earner for Kenya came at a price. A lot of people say that the horticulture and agricultural industry lowered the level of the lake by four meters. But the two industries attracted a stream of people flocking to Nevasha in search of jobs. The impact was dramatic. Lake levels went down. And at the same time, um, we saw the town sewage was pouring into the lake. I think it's now 15, 16 years where the sewage has just poured into the lake 365 days a year. That has totally destroyed the lake. Because of the human population, we have more villages with absolutely no sewage treatment at all. So it's good old fashioned long drops and that finds its way into our shallow aquifer that extends a long way back, which finds its way back into our lake. Yes, I agree. They, has been ha they, they have been having uh, serious challenges in managing the sewage in, in totality because you still find uh, some sentiments finding their way into the lake. And these effluents provide rich nutrients for algae blooms that deplete the lake of its oxygen, thereby suffocating it. You have this issue always of, of having pollutants going in the direction where we can have you know, a red, gray, a red brown algae, which is quite dangerous for our wildlife species as well as livestock. Some of these um, algal you know, blooms can be poisonous. What usually happens when you have a major uh, algal bloom, uh, then uh, you create this anoxic condition in the water. And we have had cases of such where even there there are, there are fish kills. Right. Like in 2009, we had that. There was a lot of rotting at the at the lake bed, and and and, and this gave an indicator to probably what had caused the fish kill. Seen the, the fish bury up several times, especially before the lake came up. You know, there was a time the lake went down and then came up. Just when it went down, in fact, there are hundreds of fish that died. As more and more people flocked to Nevasha, more sewage entered the lake and more and more water was being taken out of it. The pressure on the lake and the fish eagles was building. In 2009, Lake Nevasha was at its lowest level, the lowest it had ever been in 60 years. In fact, the water level that you see over here was out one kilometer, just a little puddle at the back over there. And because fish eagles need perches to hunt efficiently, they had to adapt to novel ways in order to get their food. And one of the ways they did that was by perching at the backs of hippos. But all the people working around Lake Nevasha needed to eat as well, and so fishing also boomed, both legal and illegal. The numbers of fishermen, both legal and illegal, increased 10, 20-fold. One of the biggest problems has been the proliferation of nets all over the lake. Overfishing is a problem because we, we have the, the, the overfishing, we have poachers also, and we have seining. We call it corrosion. There are so many poachers, but the poachers are just coming from within. I will tell you that 
One of the biggest menaces that we have in Lake Naivasha is illegal fishing, what we call the unlicensed vessels, where, where, where illegal, I mean, people out there in the bushes, you know, make wooden vessels that are not, do not have any color, and they hide them in the bushes, and they use it for purely illegal fishing. What we are doing about that is that every day we, we, we are able to organize for patrols. We joined one of the county patrol boats and their chairman, Daniel Onyango. He explained to us that every single day, they seize and destroy undersized fishing nets, confiscate illegal fishing boats, and with the help of the fishing community, deter unlicensed fishermen and arrest fish poachers who are then prosecuted and fined. But the overfishing still goes on, on a massive scale, with the disastrous consequences for the papyrus plants lining the shore. The papyrus belt is a critical filtration system that has declined by nearly 80% over the last four decades. The papyrus belt was the the lungs of the lake, the life support system that this lake had. But as the papyrus got eaten away and destroyed, every time it rained, all the silt, sludge, garbage came into the lake and it's still doing the same now, 10 years later. There are more and more people around here. There's more and more need for water. There's more and more nutrients flowing into the lake, causing turbidity. And there's more and more industry and farming around the lake, which means a lot of the big trees have been taken out, which is what they use for their nests. There's many, many problems that these poor fish eagles have to deal with. What was the difference in fish eagle densities between pristine and degraded habitat? Well, the difference is actually quite staggering, and that's the major, th major threat, habitat destruction. So around where we are now, where we have lush acacia woodlands, nice steep shores. Uh, the density is about five eagles per kilometer. But then when you go to the side of the lake where there's complete coverage of flower farms, riparian trees have been raised down to the ground, uh, that goes down to 0 0.5 eagles per kilometer. So the density in good habitats is, is 10 times more. And yet, despite the rapidly changing and degraded environment, the fish eagles continue to thrive. We'll find out why next week. So the numbers of eagles have more than doubled. But the fish eagles love them. They will catch and eat whatever they can. The real problem releasing birds because there are so many birds on this lake, there's no spare territory. <laughs>